Well, joining us is uh, Alpash Patel, CEO of Prifinium Partners. Good morning. Morning. Morning, uh, morning. Let's take a look at some bit more of the detail in those articles. And as we were hearing in our headlines, because we've, the BBC's done a, an interview with a former Islamic State militant uh, talking about uh, jihadi John being something of a, a loner. But The Guardian has, uh, well, uh, not a different take, but another take. They've spoken to people who work with him in Kuwait. What, what does the article say? Yeah, well, the concern here, the underlying story here is that it's so very difficult to profile uh, and to find uh, early signs, early warning signs, early red flags, because as you rightly say, and, and the paper looks into this, uh, uh, he's from Kuwait. Now that's not known as a breeding ground for, uh, for terrorists. It's not as if he'd come from uh, Yemen, for instance. Uh, he went to school in St. John's Wood. Again, not exactly known for its uh, uh, fundamentalist schooling. Uh, and he was in IT sales, uh, you know, employee of the year. Now that's worrying because where do you start when it comes to profiling? The positive side of any of this is he had been picked up by the British security services uh, some four or five years ago. Uh, and in some of the other papers, there's a whole stream of uh, uh, stories that whether that might have tipped him over the edge, which is absolute nonsense. The good news is that they had picked up on him. But what could they do when he doesn't fit any, as I say, of the traditional profiles? And what do we do going forward? If amongst us, British passport holders uh, uh, just do not trigger any red flags that we can say that's a, a, a likely terrorist. And I suppose the other side of this is, um, you know, even if by this stage when he was working in Kuwait, he had started to become radicalised and started to, to, to espouse extreme views. I mean, he's unlikely to, to say anything at work, is he? I mean, you know. No, absolutely. And of course, you would hide it. But... Um, I think what surprises people when they read this article and the ones that I read in the other papers is IT sales. It looks so normal. It sounds... Well, he clearly had a career. Yeah, yeah, him, yeah absolutely. I mean, because we all, the idea that we're always told is that yeah. people have no hope and they're desperate, exactly. no prospects, and, yeah. and he doesn't fit that, and that, that model. And they're plucked from a, 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 a sort of a poor background and uh, they're from a deprived area and so on. Uh, what's, what's very worrying is that they could be our work colleagues uh, who are... Uh, uh, who are potential terrorists. That's the way it looks. Of course, that's highly unlikely that our work are like that, but that's the way it looks. It's the way the stories come across, and that's what I think makes this even more of a story. Now, the Independent front page and many other papers, including the Moscow Times, that we, we, have, we highlighted the Independent striking image on their front page, article talking about this, uh, this protest that was... Uh, originally planned and, and was going to be um, attended by um, Boris Nemtsov. He was going to be there at this yeah. protest march. Actually, it, it turned into a very different event and his face was all over the placards. Yes, well, first of all, one of the things that's astounding, and you look at some of the, the Russian papers, look at the Moscow Times, uh, and the image is a, a, a graphic because it it's, it's an ocean of protesters and the fact that they're allowed to be that close uh, to the Kremlin uh, just signifies the importance of this, uh, this protest. And, and if, it, if, if, the, uh, if uh, Vladimir Putin did have anything to do with it, well, this is some, to somewhat extent has uh, backfired. Uh, one of the theories which is coming out from the, the Russian investigative committee looking into this uh, uh, is that it might have been Islamic extremists. Now, I know Islamic extremists get blamed for pretty much everything and they deserve to be for, for most things, but this seems a bit far-fetched well, to say... Particularly, it, particularly in Russia. I mean, they're often quick, quick to put the in finger Moscow, in Chechens, aren't they? In, in the shadow of the Kremlin. Yeah. But again, that is almost as if it's sending a message. If you're assassinating somebody in the shadow of the Kremlin, the and the Kremlin is one of the most protected and guarded places in all of, all of uh, uh, Moscow, let alone all of, all of Russia, and I was there recently, uh, uh, that you can get away with it and just drive off, uh, uh, makes one wonder uh, whether either the security services in Russia were asleep at the wheel or they were complicit. And that's the suspicion. Talking of which, uh, yeah. while we're talking about this story, of course, you know, Russia remaining in, in the thick of it in terms of international relations, uh, sanctions are still in place um, regarding the situation with uh, the east of Ukraine. And the ruble seeing the biggest monthly gain uh, in the month of February, was that? I presume, yeah. or was it January? Uh, I think it was February. Anyway, regardless... 
Oil prices are going up again. Is it just about that, or is there something else going well, it's on? It's a bit here? surprising that they talk about kind of an easing of the geopolitical situation. I mean, and yet every day yeah. we're reporting that things haven't got any better at all. Yeah, well, I think what it is is, and 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 you'll know with this, with with the markets um, as well, Sally, on this, that uh, uh, when when the news doesn't get worse and you think it's already pretty bad, but it hasn't got worse than you might otherwise have expected, you get a bit of a uh, what we traders would call a dead cat bounce. Uh, uh, I but don't it's got to be about oil, surely. I mean, it's, it's such a, Well, it's three it's, things. I think such it, a big part of I think of it is economy. about the oil. And if you look back at oil prices in 1999, they had a bit of a V-shape, just like they're going through at the moment. And I think they'll be back to $80 before the year end uh, per barrel. So I think it's partly that uh, uh, on the economic front. I also think the Ukraine ceasefire holding uh, is, is a story. It's an excuse for traders to, to buy into the ruble, given how much it performed, 40% off last year. So it was more a trading story than anything fundamental. Um, the Indian budget, <laughs> uh, it was Saturday, just uh, a, you know, perhaps yeah. your quick take on it. Um, sure, just came back from, from India actually and I was commentating on this. And you know the biggest worrying thing with India is the number of entrepreneurs, which India of course needs desperately, who are wanting to set up businesses overseas because it's so difficult to do business in India. And the budget doesn't really help with that in the short term because it's very difficult to ease doing business uh, in a country in the short term. Uh, uh, and I was out there and I spoke to about 100 entrepreneurs at various conferences looking to help them set up in the UK as part of the British government's UK Trade and Investment Global Entrepreneur Programme. We've got these Indian entrepreneurs coming up here, which is one of the key concerns in one sense for India, that whether it's the budget or other ways, getting the, that talent to stay and grow business there is still difficult. I think the most important thing that the uh, finance minister could have done is, is actually take a leaf out of Britain's book and, and had an arrangement with all the tax evaders and the tax dodgers who've got their money stashed billions overseas, and it's, it's well known billions overseas, and, and given them uh, what we did in Britain, which is to say you're going to get a slap on the wrist, but you're going to have to pay the tax, pay interest and a penalty, but you won't go to prison. Uh, for which, of course, Britain got criticised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but guess what? That works a lot better than saying to somebody, you're going to go to prison, because if you're going to send them to prison, they just won't send the money and back. And do you think Indian businessmen will, will respond to that? Just if, if they'd done that in the budget, which they didn't, yeah. then it would have meant billions into the exchequer, I reckon, yeah. uh, which, is, which is a far quicker way of getting money into the exchequer than the, uh, than the budget uh, as, as uh, it exists now, Alpesh, will do. We're running out of time, so you take your pick. Global, the, the World Congress in Barcelona, Tech Conference, or Prince William in China? What do you I think talk Spain. About? I think Spain and the Tech Conference. <laughs> All right. uh, we've got you know, the likes of Facebook there and Mark Zuckerberg and so on. There's a wonderful quote in uh, one of the papers that Facebook is a, 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 a little bit like the company that comes to your party, or Mark Zuckerberg is like the guy who comes to your party, drinks your uh, champagne, kisses the girls, and, and leaves nothing behind, doesn't bring anything to the party. And that's talking about the relationship, isn't it, between the big With the tech telcos. giants so and the, the telecom providers. So the telcos providers. are whinging that they're not making the kind of money that Facebook makes, yet if you looked at your mobile phone bill, you, you, you'd uh, disagree with them okay. somewhat. What's great about this story is the amount of innovation going on in Europe. Alpesh, many thanks for joining <laughs> us. There's not that's enough it. time. I know there's never enough time. There's, there's so much time. to talk about. See you Have soon. Have a really bye good bye. day. Bye-bye.